All right, hey everybody, if you're watching this video, that means you wanna hear about question 171 and 172. Um, you've done a lot of work to uh, tell if things are functions, and today your focus is on functions, you're gonna describe the inputs and outputs of functions. So question 171, Mr. Chan's gonna take us through it in a second. Um, it says, examine the graph of the relationship at right, and that's the graph down here that we're seeing, and use it to estimate all these things, so like when y, when x equals negative four. So Mr. Chan, a lot of great work there. Let's, uh, let's see what you did. Tell me what you did. Okay, so for this problem, uh, it spells it out in words. I'm looking for different y values, also known as the output, when given different x values, which are my inputs. And so like in part A, uh, when I'm using a graph uh, of this thing shown here, I look at my x, the input. When that's put in, what does my function say? It gives me an output of something around negative 3.75. Um, and uh, later, for these other two parts, like B and C, we see that when we go through the same process, like in part B, where the input here is uh, positive 1, we see that we have actually two outputs. And both of these are uh, the, uh, what the graph is telling us for the y values, the outputs. And again, for part C, we see there's three things, which leads us to part D, and connecting it back to what we studied before, um, because these two uh, inputs all have different outputs, um, it's inconsistent, just like with the uh, soda machine. So uh, what we have here, this little line, this relation is not a function, because each um, input doesn't have exactly one output. So I press the one button and I get uh, two and, oops, negative three. Mm. You add on, Mr. Fortin? Nothing to add on, uh, Mr. Chan. Thank you very much for taking us through that. I liked how you kept going back to the x-axis. you got to find your x, so find your x at negative 4, and then looking up and looking down. I liked how you kept drawing up and down. So we go to x equals negative 4, look up, look down. Oop, only one output there uh, for y being negative 3.75, or as the output, as you said. Um, so very good there, one output there. But then, yeah, the other inputs you were testing had more than one output. So I agree, those were not functions. Yeah, I thought about it the exact same way. So here I have this um, assignment right here um, and then you took us through and uh, I was taking it through and then this assignment is actually written a little bit differently. I just happened to notice and the order is a little bit differently. But I thought about the same thing too. So when x equaled 4, um, we actually had two outputs. We had three, sorry, three outputs for y. And I had said about 3.2. I'm not sure exactly what you said. Did you say 3.2 or something similar? Uh, I said 3. You said three. Okay. Mine was a little bit above three. I don't know if that's different in the textbooks, but uh, well, our part A and C's are different. Yeah. Too, part so A and C's are different. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if that's worth calling out, but it's like, yeah, you just got to have to estimate that one because it's between three and four. So I did 3.2 uh, and then zero and negative 2.3. And then, yeah, I had two outputs for when X equaled one, uh, at two and negative three, and then just one output about negative 3.7 or so is what I said. I think you said negative 3.75. So just an estimation is, is good there. Um, if you notice here in my textbook, I, we had a little bit of difference of notice of, of writing this out here. Um, so they used function notation in my textbook that I was looking at. This is an older version of the textbook, I guess. And they said that this function was named h of x. Um, so that's just worth pointing out that uh, when you see something like h of x or f of x, don't be scared of that, right? h of x or f of x is just a fancy way of saying y. So uh, what I did there with my y-axis, I changed that to the h of x-axis because uh, it's a function of x and the name of that function is h. So anyways, um, so this was similar, right? This just means the same exact thing. When you see h of 4, remember the parentheses here mean of, so h of 4, that just means find y when x equals 3, which is what you saw in the online textbook and what Mr. Chan saw. So when x equals, sorry, when x equals 4. Um, and then, yeah, the question was out of order too. So anyways, when uh, x equaled four, I got those three answers. And when x equaled one, I got those two answers. And h of negative four, which is the y value when x is negative four, I got negative 3.7. So same thing too. And I also decided, yes, not a function because of this situation right here. We have an x of four and we have more than one output for y not a function. So because Mr. Fortin introduced this function notation idea, this next problem has you practice more of that function notation. And if you're ever lost about it, you can always go back to what we reviewed um, earlier in this chapter with the function machines, with the input and drawing it out, um, thinking about input and outputs uh, that ways. 
Okay, great, thanks. So in question 172, it has an actual function machine here. So this is sort of gets back to what I was talking about a, a second ago, which uh, you have a function, this is function f here, where you need to find an f of x, uh, which is an output, an f of x output, for a given input of x. So it sounds confusing. I hope you uh, understand that. If not, you can go back early in the chapter. Um, in the first question, it's asking you to find f of negative three, and then to find f of zero, and then to finally find f of two. So if we see this number in parentheses here, negative three, that is just your x value, right? Your x value. And f of negative three represents your y value. So you're just, your, your output is a better way of putting that here. So uh, for this here, I plugged in negative three to this machine, dropped it in, of course, as we've been doing. And then I had down here, right? I had negative three minus three, and that's negative six. So I end up with six being divided by negative six, and that's negative one. Uh, part, the second part of that is dropping in zero. Zero, if I had zero minus three in the denominator, then I get negative three in the denominator. And six divided by a negative is a negative, so six divided by negative three would just be uh, the opposite of two, right? Negative two. And finally, I got negative six for f of two, right? Drop in two, um, six over two minus three is negative one. And that just means divide six by one, make it negative, and so that would be negative six as my final output. Um, so this one for me like felt a little bit tricky because I was changing what my denominator was based on what the X was. And uh, my numbers are pretty small here. They got a little bit bigger here at the, at the end. Um, and then I'll talk about B too, because B was kind of the interesting one here. F of negative three was kind of the most interesting problem to me when I did this one here. So sorry, F of positive three. So if F of three here means we drop in three for X, and didn't happen on these ones here, right? You're messing around, the denominator is changing on each one because that's where the input is, that's where x is here. But when you put in an f, uh, an x of three into this function, it actually, you'd have to subtract three from it, right? Because that's what this function does. You take the number six, you divide it by whatever your input is, less three. And if your input is three, three minus three is zero. So all of a sudden, you have a denominator of zero. And this hasn't come up too, too much so far this year, but it's a rule in math where you can't divide things zero ways. It's impossible, okay, it's impossible. So it's probably come up in the past before, so think back. Have you been able to divide something zero ways to zero people, or um, you uh, have $6 needed to divide it zero ways? Can't do that, right? You can have $6, you can divide it uh, one way, right? One person can get the $6, but you can't divide $6 zero ways. Doesn't happen. So this one was tricky. So here's what I put as my answer. Uh, I said that there was no solution. When x equals three, there was no solution for the function or there was no output. So if you divide by zero, um, then things break, right? Things break. It's not allowed right now. It's something that's called undefined. So uh, for this one here, we get no output, okay? When x equals three, we get no output because you can't divide by zero. And that was sort of my justification for that one uh, here. Mr. Chan, do you have anything to add to that? Nope, cool. that looks good. Sounds good, all right. So was that the special number though, right? X equals three, is that the only time that didn't work, that the machine didn't work for you? Uh, seems like it. Seems I like tried it. a couple other values, but nothing else would break the function machine. Okay, cool. So I'll continue on here uh, with C. Um, yeah, that that x equals three. I said no. For C is asking, are there any other inputs that cannot be evaluated by this function? That means, is there any other input that's going to break this machine? Remember, sometimes the machine doesn't work, doesn't give you an output. Um, and no, I think just three is the only one, right? When you have a denominator, you just have to worry about it, right? That it can't can't be zero. And an input of three. Right, so an input of three wouldn't make the denominator three. An input of three would make the denominator zero. So three is not allowed. Uh, I'm glad that Mr. Chan got what I got, <laughs> which is that uh, all other outputs would be allowed for x, since x equals three is the only value that would lead to a denominator of zero. So that's what you need to be on the lookout for uh, as we continue on with this uh, this stuff here. Um, okay, part D. Um, we're going to talk about domain. Mr. Chan, do you want to go through D and E? I feel like I've been talking a lot here. Sure. Yep. Cool. Um, so in part D, um, I'll read it. The set it's of numbers sure. that can be used okay. for x in a function and still get an output is called the domain of a function. The domain is a description of all possible x values for a function. And our goal is to describe the domain for this certain thing. 
And how I like to think about it is this domain is just fancy words for saying all possible inputs, right? And I'll let Mr. Fortin take it from here. Um, yeah, so the domain is all possible inputs, um, and all of our inputs could have been any real number. So any number that we're aware of right now could be a fraction, could be a decimal, could be a, a square root value, which we'll actually get to in the next problem. Um, could be negative, could be positive. Uh, but any number really that we're aware of right now, we can put in for x. We just can't put in 3. So this is how we would describe the domain of this particular function. And so uh, part E, it asks us, okay, here's one example of something that has a limited domain or uh, you know, breaks our function machine. Are there other functions we studied so far that could also have a limited domain that like some numbers don't work for um, the given function? Cool. And uh, the one that we came up with, it sounded like Mr. Chan came up with a similar one too, but uh, square root functions. You may have remembered those from a few sections ago, but square root functions, those have limited domains. That's how we'll describe those. Those have limited domains. So um, in this example that I had up, I did f of x equals the square root of x minus two, and I created a table. One way to tell kind of uh, what the uh, domain of a function is, if you have some time and want to figure it out exactly, is set up a table and plug in values into that function machine here. And so I started doing that. So I started plugging in negative values first. If I plug in negative 1 for x, um, then I get uh, negative 1 minus 2. To get the output of this function, I would need to take the square root of that. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. Can't take the square root of that, right? Can't take a square root of negative number. And you might notice this on your calculator. It, it says domain error because that means that you can't put that underneath the square root. You can't input negative 1 for x here. You couldn't input 0 for x here uh, because you get the square root of negative 2, and that's a domain error. You couldn't input 1, so none of these are part of the domain. Okay, no, Negative 1, 0, and 1 are not part of the domain of this function here. f of x equals the square root of x minus 2. Um, so where you start noticing uh, square root, uh, if domain starts, is when you get the square root of 0. Right, when you get the square root of zero right here, because the number multiplied to itself that is zero, well, that's just zero, right? That's just zero right here. So you get that by input, and input, if you dropped in a two here for x, then you would get two minus two, which is zero. You'd get the square root of zero, which is zero. So that's where our domain actually begins. And um, all numbers larger than two would lead to then positive square roots, which would all have a real number answer here. So this is where our domain begins. Starts at 2, and where does it end? Mr. Chan, where does it end? Where does our domain end? Uh, we can keep going. <laughs> keep going forever. Yeah, keep going forever. Okay, so here is our domain. Our domain is all values greater than uh, 2, right? Than 2, okay? In our domain of that function. Okie dokie, so that's my answer there. Domain of this function is all values of x that are 2 and above. Or if we wrote it out in inequalities, x is greater than or equal to 2. Uh, anything to add to that, Mr. Chan? Not at all. Cool. Sounds good. All right, hopefully this video is helpful. Um, we've got another video coming your way for uh, 173 and 174.